Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here at the John Hope Franklin Center. We're joined today by Professor Joseph R. Winters, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Duke University. He's the author of the new book, Hope Draped in Black, Race, Melancholy, and the Agony of Progress, Duke University Press. How are you doing today, Thanks, I'm good, man. Thanks, Thanks for, for having joining me. us here at Left of Black. Thanks for having um, me. Hope Draped in Black, immediately, of course, we have to think about the Obama presidency mm -hmm. and this kind of notion of hope. Mm -hmm. But you throw into the, the mix melancholic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hope. Right. Unpack that for us for a moment. So, <laughs> yeah, no, so, so for me, um, the term melancholy usually within, uh, you know, kind of academic discourse usually goes back to Freud's, right, yeah. Freud's essay, Distinction Between Mourning and Melancholy. I won't go too much into it, but the, the distinction for him is one, both of them are responses to loss, yeah. responses to a, a painful event, right? But for Freud, mourning usually has this, right, uh, teleological dimension insofar as you lose an object and you're able to substitute it with another one. Whereas melancholy for him can becomes kind of pathological. But I want to suggest, right, um, especially kind of reading through someone like Anne Chang or Judith Butler, right, that actually there might be something about melancholy that opens up a certain a set of ethical possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, right, when I think of melancholy, I think of, right, a kind of what I call a kind of stubborn remembrance, right, right? Especially in a culture, right, that seems to celebrate progressive narratives, right? Like we've, we've arrived or we're moving forward, right? Or that uses, right, certain events from the past to celebrate, right, some kind of exceptional notion of America, right? So I think of melancholy in terms of remembrance, but I also think about it as a kind of openness to the broken, the breaks and cuts of, of history, right. right, of social existence. And so, you know, for me, melancholy is not necessarily reducible to pessimism or, or to dis despair, right. but it's actually potentially connected to hope, pleasure, possibility, especially within black studies, right? And, and, and I mean, you open yeah. the book at that kind of moment of, of hope, you know, mm -hmm. connected it to John McCain right. talking <laughs> about, you know, this moment of transcendence right. that represents, you know, right. Barack Obama's election. Definitely. Um, right. The irony, of course, is now eight years later, Later, right. <laughs> right, that right. those very ideas of progress are, right. are, are under assault, right. Exactly. Right? If, no. if they ever held they sway in the first place. Exactly, no, so he's exactly right. So I think, I, because I, I, to, to some extent, I could have started with um, Barack Obama's 2008 victory speech, right? Yeah. But to start with McCain is actually really interesting, because number one, he lost, right? right. So he right. started with the moment of lost, and then, you know, basically him saying, which I think was, I mean, it was, it was a very interesting, right? It was a very interesting speech, because on one hand, what he does is he compares, um, the first black president coming to the White House, right, to, uh, you know, Roosevelt, right, inviting, formally right. inviting, right, Booker T. Washington to the White right. House, right? And then he suggests, you know, basically, right, this is, right, this is a moment, right, this is a moment of triumph, but he also suggests that, like, you know, that, um, he also says that the meaning of this, or this signifies that no, that no American should actually, right, be ambiguous about their citizenship, right, and that this shows that we're the greatest nation on earth. So it, he turns this moment of loss for himself, right, and then he goes right to a kind of, he talks about the tradition of black yeah. struggle, right, of, of, of ex exclusion of blackness, and then he goes right, into, and then he makes a move to, right, you know, a kind of we've, we've arrived, right? This, 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 is, this demonstrates, right, that America is, is, is an exceptional place, is an exceptional democracy, and so forth, right? But um, and as you said, yeah, eight years later, right, th these, 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 these kinds of narratives have, 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 been, have been troubled very explicitly, as, as if you said, as if, as if they ever carry the kind of weight, right, that they seem to carry at least in those, that, those couple months right after his, after his uh, victory. Right? You, you begin the book going back to Du Bois, mm -hmm. right, and right. unpacking some of these very tensions right. and what is, you know, I, I don't think anybody would ever argue that in the souls of black folks is Du Bois' best work, right? right? right but right, it, it's right. clearly the most right. known, the mm -hmm. most critiqued, the right. most read, right. the one that gets circulated in black right, studies right. courses exactly. most often. Exactly. Why Du Bois? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> point. So I think precisely because of this point, right, because I, I asked myself, the same question, why Du Bois, especially since so many people start well, with Du Bois, there's been so many critiques, <laughs> important critiques by the Hazel Carveys and others, Adolf Reed, like why do we, can you start with Du Bois? And also like you said, there are other texts that he seems to be, where he seems to have a more nuanced understanding of black experience, right, uh, race, gender, class connections, right? I think for me it's precisely the tensions, right, in, in, the, in the text, right? So there are moments where it seems like he's really optimistic, right? Yeah. There's this moment where, I mean, he's, there's an optimism around, uh, certain, I mean, He's born in 1868, he writes, right? I mean, so there's an optimism clearly around, right, you know, the end of slavery, yeah. right? There's an optimism around <coughs> 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. There's an optimism around black leadership, right? right. You know, education. But then there's this other, right, there's, 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 there's this other thing going on, right? In chapters like, uh, you know, on progress, the Sorrow Songs, right? Yeah. You know, where it's, 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 it's not just the content where he's tracing, right, the, the kind of, um, the experiences, the, you know, the uh, new forms of power and domination that control, that regulate black bodies, right? 
but he's also, it's the mood of the text, right? There's a certain tone, right? Where something like melancholy, grief, right? But, but again, not necessarily disconnected from the hope, right? I want to suggest, yeah. right? But that a sense of hope comes, to, comes for, for him through working through, right, that more tragic side, right? And the kind of ongoing injustices that black Americans face. Right? You mentioned mm -hmm. the tensions just in the kind of multi-generic yeah, aspect yeah, of it, yeah, or right. what, what I'd like to think yeah. of as kind of multi-platforms. Right, right. He's, he's writing from all of these different vantage mm -hmm. points, you know, kind of memoirish. Right, right. You know, there's a, a, a funeral dirge, for right. lack of a better right. way to describe right. it. There's right. music criticism, music I mean, sorrow songs. Yeah, exactly, music. no, exactly. I mean, it's all of that, and, and you suggest in the book that, you know, it highlights a kind of fraught relationship I, I think that's mm -hmm. writ large for black studies, but clearly mm -hmm. in terms of black political thought Definitely. around black aesthetics, right. black ethics, and black politics, Definitely. right? And right. he's trying to grapple with mm -hmm. creating a wholeness to a project right. that resists that, that kind resists of wholeness. It. Exactly. No, you've got, that's exactly. So he, you know, he himself was. Um, several commentators have pointed this out. He was never really satisfied with the coherence of the text. He thought that it, it lacked a kind of unified method. Because as you point out. Right, there seems to be an ethnography going on at one point, mm -hmm. memoir, essay, there's fiction, right? Um, and then the fact that he starts each chapter with a poem and a line from the sorrow song, right? So there's all these, right? He even has a yeah. prayer at the end, right? He, a prayer to the reader, right? I mean, so for it, me- it's, it's Kanye's skits. Yes, exactly, no, exactly, no, exactly, no, exactly, where there's these bre breaks and interruptions, right? Yeah. Like you can see it as, and for me, it's precisely, um, uh, I don't know if I call it brokenness, but it's precisely that incoherence with regard yeah. to genre right. that for me right. reflects right. like the complexities of the things he's trying to get at, right? What would it mean to try to get at the complexities, right, of, of, of you know, of racial formations in America with one, right, with one, with one, right? I mean, we need all the different kinds of approaches, right, that it seems to me Du Bois kind of, kind of, kind of embodied in many ways in his writing. One of the things that you do that's important in the book is that you kind of push us beyond the text, if you will. Mm -hmm to think about you know, what this looks like in terms of music mm -hmm. and also visual culture. Right, um, right. The literary jazz mm -hmm. of Ellison mm -hmm. and Toni Morrison becomes one way that you right. do that. Um, right. Of course, rethinking the sorrow song. Right. So, so for a moment, talk about you know, Ellison and Morrison mm -hmm. and the relationship right. and their use of jazz, jazz yeah. and their music to right. offer certain kind of critiques around hope. hope and yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. So, so for, for, Ralph, for Ralph Ellison, um, somebody who I think had a deep right, appreciation right, for, for certain forms of jazz, right? Because uh, when it came, after, after bebop, he was, he was very critical. But what I, I took for Ellison, a text like uh, Invisible Man, mm -hmm. right? You know, at the beginning, right, there's a way in which he's, he's, he's reflecting on right, Louis Armstrong, right? Yeah. And suggesting, right, how is it that he, uh, Louis Armstrong is able to make art out of, out of invisibility, right? Right? As, some, right, as somebody who's rendered invisible in different ways, right, he's actually been able to turn that into a, an, an occasion for creativity, right? So there's that, so clearly starting off with that is, 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 is important, right? But throughout there's, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's um, kind of musical tropes, right? He talks about, um, you know, uh, a jazz, uh, cons uh, a, a jazz uh, imbued sense of time being, right, not swift and linear, right? Sometimes he says you're ahead of the beat, sometimes behind the beat, right? And so for me it was, it was you know, taking that notion, right, yeah. of having different rhythms, different relationships to time, right? Where you, you know, because especially when there's this pressure to kind of keep moving forward, yeah. like leave, yeah. that, leave certain parts of the past behind. Right, and if you connect that to, um, because for Ellison, right, I think jazz and blues are, are really intertwined, right? Um, I think he, he starts getting, getting critical of certain forms of jazz that kind of um, get separated from that kind of blues, right, you know, that blues connection um, and antecedent. But I think when he talks about um, Richard Rice blues, he talks about blues as, right, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna butcher the, the quotation, but it's something like keeping, right, uh, keeping pain alive in one's yeah. making consciousness, right, but transcending it with a tragic comic lyricism. And so that, I, I always went back to that and I'm saying to myself, right, so there's a sense of transcending pain, but not in the sense in which you resolve it, right? It just gets re-expressed, right, mm -hmm. through tragedy and comedy, right? So laughter is important, right? So, so yeah, so I guess for me, taking the jazz and the blues there, right? So he's clearly thinking about, you know, kind of concrete practices, right? Mm -hmm. But then they become, right, when he takes it, when he incorporates it into, right, into the novel, right, they become tropes, right? Because some even say jazz is a character in the novel, right? Yeah, but they become, yeah. but they become these kinds of tropes, right? And these kinds of ways in which, right, linear notions of progress, right, um, associated with American democracy, associated with Marxism, get troubled in certain kinds of ways, right? And I think it's important, right, to think about, right, to think about, right, jazz and all of its different expressions, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're yeah. watching yeah. Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Evnia. We're joined today by Professor Joseph R. Winters, who is assistant professor of religious studies here at Duke University. He's the author of the new book, Hope Draped in Black, Race Melancholy, the Agony of Progress. To think about progress for a second, um, uh, you know, Russell Rickford has a great essay that he just published um, uh, African-American uh, Intellectual History and Society. Um, mm -hmm. 
And he talks about in this moment of protest, um, and, and every institution is trying to respond by creating some sort of context right. for progress. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of that progress is always, let's sit down and have a conversation, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and he argues that it, it's such a neoliberal thing mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. try to contain mm -hmm. progress, right? right. And, and we see that same thing in terms of black cultural production. Mm -hmm throughout the 20th and 21st century. Mm -hmm. You identify two films mm -hmm. that, that push back against mm -hmm. this idea mm -hmm. of racial transcendence mm -hmm. and progress. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Bennett's cl classic, Killer mm -hmm. Sheep, with mm -hmm. not nearly enough folks have had mm -hmm. the chance to see. Right. Um, and then F. Gary Gray's, yeah. you know, set it off. And right. you know, two different historical moments. Right two very different types of film, the yes. art film versus mm -hmm. the kind of yeah. crossover right. hip-hop film. Right. Talk about the work that those two films do in terms mm -hmm. of, of destabilizing some sort mm -hmm. of set idea that, you know, crisis happens, trauma right. happens, and somehow we can contain right. those moments and move right. forward, definitely. you know, to right. some sort of notion of progress. No, definitely. Um, so, I was, you know, thinking about the movement of, 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 the, of the book, right? It was like, okay, you're dealing with all, I'm dealing with all this literature, I'm dealing with right, yeah. music, and I was like, but yeah, but there's something about film, right? There's something about film that, that visualizes progress in a certain type of way, right? Or visualizes the troubling of progress, right? So, you know, you think about- I mean, that's what, that's yeah. what Selma's about. Yeah, exactly, no, exactly, <laughs> right. no, exactly, right. no, exactly, right. right. So, you think about, right, um, not only the themes of a film, right, but just how, right, just how the narrative kind of, right, is organized, right, yeah. and kind of structured, right? So. Um, as you point out, Killer Sheep, great, you know, uh, great independent film by Charles Burnett, right? Very different kind of film, right? right. And probably what I wanted to do, then, then set it off, is I wanted to kind of, I mean, to some extent, I mean, they're both set in Los Angeles in interesting types of ways, right? Right, one Watts, one South Central, right? 20, maybe almost 20 years apart. But I wanted to kind of think about, right? Because it would have been, it may, might have been a little easier to kind of take, you know, two kind of avant-garde films, yeah, right? right? But I wanted to right. look at like some right. popular films that, you know, it looks like a typical heist film, right? Typical yeah. kind of hip hop, right? right. You know, like, uh, you, know, um, you know, urban action film in the 90s, yeah. right? But something is going on. So with, with, with Killer of Sheep, what's interesting to me, right, um, is precisely, right, this is, right, this is, it's, it's, I think, it's like, ten, right, it's made 10 years after, right, the Watts riots. And there's constant, right, constant ways in which, right, right, images of the, of, of the riots, right, are being repeated in a yeah, certain type of way. Yeah. Children throwing rocks at trains, right? Children throwing rocks at each other. You see the dilapidated buildings. You see right. the kind of, you see the ruins, right? And so it's throughout, mm -hmm. right, throughout the, right, throughout the, the um, you know, throughout the film, right, the viewer is constantly having to, right, both repeat, right, and constantly have to think about and remember, right, what, like the Watts riots, right? Yeah. Those, those, those parts, right, those parts of the black freedom struggles and civil rights movement, right, that don't fit in these kinds of, right, you know, triumphant narratives, right? Um, so you have that. You also have a way in which the film is organized, right? You don't, the, the first 15, 20 minutes before Stan's character is introduced, you don't really know where the film is going, <laughs> well, right? You're right, kind of like, right, right. who's the main characters, right? There are these, right. these right, you know, the, the certain, a certain character might come into, right, into the frame, do something, and then you don't see them for, for, for a couple other scenes, right? And so it, it is this kind of like, right? And of course, he's being influenced by, um, you know, uh, various, you know, um, neorealism, right? French, you know, French right. New Wave and so right. forth, right? But, but there's also a kind of, almost a, a kind of, you know, a reality, a cinema verite yeah. quality to yeah. it, right? You know, so, so anyway, so there's a way in which, like, the, the, the very structure and organization of the film, right, troubles any kind of, like, forward-moving narrative, yeah. right? But then the images, right, are constantly, but not in a way that's, that's simply just pessimistic, right? Because I think, right, the, the important relationship between image and sound here, right? You've got Paul Robeson, right, going home, right? You've got Paul Robeson, right, the house I live in, right? Um, West End Blues, right, uh, Louis Armstrong. You also have Dinah Washington, one of my favorite right, uh, yeah. songs, right? This Bitter Earth, right? So there's a way in which, yeah. right, the, the kind of pain and pleasure associated with blues, jazz, yeah. and the sorrow songs, right, are somehow connected to and inform the images, right, of the film. So I don't want to say it, it, it ends on some kind of pessimistic note, but it ends on a note, I think, full of certain kind of tensions. You're left with certain tensions. Um, and with F. Gary Gray's film, Right, I, I had to. I think we talked about this. I had to come back to the film, right? So when I watched it, um, you know, early, you know, mid '90s, I don't think I took that much from it. Right. But going back right. to it, right, the way in which a certain kind of American, right, American dream narrative, right, is yeah. being disrupted. Especially, there's about three or four times throughout the film where there's a shot, right, a kind of low angle shot of the building that the women are working yeah. in, right? So yeah. you see the kind of, right, in most cities, right, it's the, the height of the buildings and the number of buildings is kind right. of like signifiers for right. progress. And then right, right, right after that, you, there's a transition into them, you know, the kind of the kind of work and labor that they're doing, right, for like four dollars an hour. So, that, right, so there's, right, there's that. So, so, so that's one of it. But I think there's also a way in which, right, the heist film, this kind of heist film, right, um, 
allows us to think about different, different types of theft and dispossession, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Some, the, the kinds of theft and dis dispossession that are seen as, 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 as illegitimate and, 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 and right and illegal, and the kind of theft and dispossession that's just taken as accepted in every day, right? right. You know? um, so anyway, yeah, so I think that's what, right, what F. Gary Gray is potentially getting at, right? When um, Vivica Fox's character says, we're just taking from the system that's messing with us, right? Yeah. Every day, right, she says another word, but she says messing with us every day anyway, right? And it's not, I'm not condoning at all, saying that the film's trying to justify, right? Because you see, right, like, like theft or, or heist, because you see clearly people are punished throughout, right? right? Except for Stoney's character, John, J Jada Pinkett, Right, but there's a way in which it's forcing us to think about the different kinds of theft and dispossessions, right, that happen right throughout, right, uh, within our world, and the kinds of theft and dispossession that are seen as legitimate and just we accept as every day. Right? Yeah. yeah, you have both personal and, and professional connections mm -hmm. in the city of Charlotte. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah, so you've been watching as everyone mm -hmm. has, as you know, the city's been dealing with various tensions, another police killing, right. um, sort of eruption, protests, and what have you. Right. You know, how do you read what's happening in cities like Charlotte, mm -hmm. in Tulsa, mm -hmm. Baltimore, Ferguson, mm -hmm. you know, most well known around the right. country? Right. Um, and, and how do you read it within this framework mm -hmm. of melancholic yeah, hope? Right. Yeah, so it's interesting to me, right, because I've been thinking a lot about this. I've been writing about it um, in some, art some articles. Um, for, for me, it's interesting because I think for some, for some people, right, it's like, okay, these last two or three years, right, with understandably, right, you've got a kind of um, this succession of right of police killings, right, that are that, that that are captured on right that are captured on tape, right, right. you know, that are that are captured by, by by iPhones and cameras in ways that you know we just didn't have the techn That's technology cool. to do, yeah. right. So for some people, it's a kind of shock, right, and yes, it should be a shock to some extent. But I, I guess, you know, there's there's a part of me that wants to just, I mean, you know, even in 0809, right, when there was this kind of collective right euphoria around Obama, right, you know, New Year's Eve. 2000, 2008, right, right, Oscar Grant, right, Oscar right, Grant, right, you know right, what I mean? So right. there's, a, there's a way in which, right, um, there's a way, I, so the there's inauguration a, doesn't even happen Doesn't even happen yet before, until, right. until that happens, right? So I guess what I'm trying to get at, there's, there's a way in which at times, right, these kinds of events, which are both about, I think, right, the kinds of protests which are about, you know, I think there's a lot of things going on. There's melancholy, there's anger, there's frustration, yeah. there's hope, right, there's struggle, right, there's all these, all these different kinds of, right, possibilities. But the way, that I, I'm interested in the way that they're narrated, right? I'm interested in the way in which they're kind of right. They're, they're narrated by, by, by public media, by academics, right? So th there's a way in which. So for instance, I remember um, a couple summers ago, right, when watching the images from coming from Ferguson and the, and the uprising in Ferguson, right, um, after the, the death of Michael Brown. And I remember one of the things that people kept saying is, right, in response to, right, the tanks, right, in response to the rubber bullets and tear gas, was, wow, is this still possible in America, right? And is that still possible? It's like, well, wait a minute, no, this has been like this. This is like, right. yeah, military style right. policing, right? You know right. what I mean, right? Has been has been has actually been very much right the norm for certain kinds of right, right? right. So right. so even there's even in those moments, there's a way in which right something like American exceptionalism, ex expectation that America somehow otherwise mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. can still kind of kind of kind of come through. Um, there's other another example would be, let's give an example. Um, right, recently uh, Eddie Glaw has been on a book tour, right, yeah. and um, he's responding to Alton Sterling's right killing, right. And he's on, um, I think he's on Bloomberg or one of, the, one, some, one of these news, news programs. And one of the, the commentators asks him and says, well, can you give us a set of best practices, right? How, right what are the best practices that we can do to resolve this? And I, you know, Eddie Glaude is certainly interested in practice, right? He's right. a pragmatist. Right. But he just said, hold on, I'm, I haven't thought about that yet, right? I still can't get the image and the sound of Alton Sterling's son, right? The cry, right? right? right. That, that conference, right. right? Let's linger with that, right? Before we try to move forward, right? right. So that to me is just, that to me is a, a kind of mundane, everyday, but well not so mundane, right? But a kind of everyday example of somebody, right? An instance of somebody who's pushing back against this kind of, uh, you know, right. pressure to resolution, right. to resolve, right? right. right. Exactly, right. right. So that's, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but as far as, yeah, as far as Charlotte, I mean, like you said, I taught, uh, taught at UNC Charlotte for, for six years. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Travis Jones, was, was, was part of the um, protests. Um, you know, students and so forth that I, that I know are part of the protests. So on one hand, there's, 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 I mean, I guess personally, there's a kind of melancholy like that sense of I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not there anymore, right? So there's a kind of separation there. But I think it's also kind of, you know, see, you know, like in addition to the melancholy, in addition to thinking about, right, you know, just the, the death of black bodies, there is a kind of hope, right? There is a kind of hope in, right, right? There is a kind of hope in and struggle, right? In the protests and the fact that different groups are organizing, right, right. and in the, the persistence of it, right, the persistence, right. I know people, even from uh, from Durham, some of the students here say, "Yeah, I'm going to the protests, right." right. So there's this, this way in which different cities in North Carolina are connecting, 
Um, so I, again, I do think, right, it's the both and, right? I think um, Fred Moten has this line in one of his talks. He says, it's both melancholy and celebration, right? It's of, of black life, but it's both melancholy and struggle, right? It's, 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 I'm trying to get beyond the optimist, you know, right. the Afro-optimism, Afro-pessimism kind of, right? It's, it's both and, it seems to me, exactly. right? And it seems to me in protest, right, whether it's a die-in, right? Whether it's images of, of, of people, you know, um, getting tear gas hurled at them, right? right? You see both. You see the kind of wow, right? The kind of violence that people have to run up against, but you also see, well, yeah, but people are also there's people are also enacting, right, and expressing right kind of lineages and traditions of struggle that have tried to make yeah. the world a, a, a more just place. Man, yeah. if you're putting together a soundtrack mm. playlist, <laughs> five songs. Uh -huh. Man. Of hip hop's melancholic hope. Oh my goodness, <laughs> this is a good one. What, what, what does that look like? Oh man, well, I, 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 so, I, it's, oh man, there's a lot. So I, I'm, I'm gonna, I would, I, would, I would start off with um, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five's The Message. Message. Right? I think precisely because if you listen to the lyrics, it's like, right, I mean, right, you know, broke, starting on broken glass everywhere. everywhere right. It almost ends of an image of, 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 of a black male in prison right. hanging himself, right? right. right? But when that song comes on, people dance, right? <laughs> right? You know, right. when that song comes on, right. it's a, there's a festive right. quality to it, right? Right. And festive so enough for Diddy and Biggie, Biggie to, 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 right, use, to use exactly. it again. No, right. exactly. To, right. Yeah. In, a, in a different context, but <laughs> but right. So I would say that there's something about that, right, where there's something like the you know the festive and melancholic are coming together. Um, I'm gonna kind of go. Over, I'm gonna jump around temporarily. Yeah. temporarily. Um, Jay Z's regrets. Mm. Got to learn to live with regrets, right? In my view, what's there is that I mean, there's a way in which he kind of pushes back in, in some sense against the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, right? A certain reading of Nietzsche is, you know, you shouldn't have any regrets, any guilt. Jay-Z saying, no, you've got to learn to live with those, right? right? I've done things in my past, things have happened in my past, right? right. Even as I quote unquote move forward, and that's, that's Jay, I mean, you've talked about this in your work. Right. Even as he moves forward and becomes, right, right this right, kind of hip hop mogul, right. he's constantly thinking about, right, you know, um, the fiends in his life, right? You know, that he's sir, right? That, you know, he's right. in the monster song, I still hear fiends in my dreams, right? So, so that, that, that sense of being, still being connected to this complicated past. Mm -hmm. That's two. Um, I would say um, Lupe Fiasco, right? Probably his whole first album, <laughs> right? Right, Food and Liquor, right? But especially, I would say, right, Hurt Me Soul, right? Yeah. Be one. Um, I would look at um, um, Kendrick Lamar, mm -hmm. right? Um, Kendrick Lamar, uh, Sing About Me, right? Yeah, yeah. Which, right, yeah. which is, yeah. which for, yeah, right. for, for me is just, um, right, you know, kind of self explanatory, but I think, right, you know, these are people who, in many ways, right, he's almost playing the, the, a kind of shaman in some way, right? Yeah. Like he's telling the story of people who are no longer there, right? right. Um, and reenacts, like, the, the killing in the song, yeah. right? Yeah. But at the end, right, there's prayer, there's a sense of, like, I'm running, I'm running, so you think right. of Fred Moten's fugitivity. So that's four, man, there's so many. Um, I'm gonna go with, uh, I'm gonna go with, with Pharaoh Monch, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking Pharaoh Monch, uh, Song with with, uh, with common and Tali of the truth, right? Mm -hmm. On Pharaoh's first album, there's something about that song that, right? You know, where Pharaoh's. I mean, there's something about that song where I mean, there's an acknowledgement like struggle. Struggle is not something that can be resolved. Pain is right. not something, right? But he says something like, yeah, but the ability to even express pain, right? He says in that song is a kind of healing, right? Is a kind. Of, it, it does something, right? It doesn't necessarily resolve it, right? But it allows you to potentially. It gives you the energy, right? To potentially, right? turn that melancholy into struggle, into resistance, yeah. into something that we are just not stifled, right, by the ongoing, right, you know, violence that happens to, you know, black bodies, black men, right. and so forth, right? So those would be my, there's, there's so many more, but those would be, I think that's what makes a good, uh, that makes a pretty decent playlist, you know? What's yeah. next for you? So next um, is a project called uh, Disturbing, uh, Disturbing Profanity, right? Okay. Um, hip hop, social death, and the ambivalence of, of the sacred. So basically, what it's, it's, my, it's my attempt to, 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 to uh, hopefully contribute to the conversations about hip-hop and religion, right? And you the know. tradition of Anthony yeah. Penn. Exactly. And, right. Monica Miller, Ebony Utley, right? right. Um, you know, Dyson, Cornell. Right. So people who are thinking, I mean, um, James Peterson's new, new book, right? Even right. though he's not on religion, he's right. thinking about, you know, literary theory and critical theory, right? right. So I want to kind of, in some sense, be, be, be religious studies being the one doing the kind of, kind of critical yeah. theory around, around hip-hop. So that's, and seeing how, right, um, hip-hop potentially allows us to reimagine um, what, we mean by, what we mean by the sacred, right? What we mean by the profane. So that's what I'm working on now. Hopefully within a, within a couple of years, right? That could, that, that'll be out, yeah, yeah. You've been watching Left of Black. We've been joined by Professor Joseph R. Winters, who's Assistant Professor of Religious Studies here at Duke University. He's the author of the new book, Hope Draped in Black. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. This has been great. This has been
Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black 